All right, well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this panel discussion on the uh, government single-use plastic bans. We're going to discuss uh, a panel of esteemed colleagues from UN private sector and NGOs uh, regarding the changes necessary to meet the growing legal frameworks in East Africa and beyond to reduce virgin and single-use plastics in an effort to avoid converging crises of environment and emergency, which are becoming more commonplace across the globe. My name is Catherine Ely. Uh, I am from the Global Logistics Cluster-led REC project, which works with a coalition of partner organizations to support humanitarian logistics, uh, logisticians with tools, training, guidance, expertise, and thought-provoking discussions, such as the one that we're going to have here today, uh, in an effort to increase awareness about environmental sustainability and reduce our impact on the natural environments in which we operate. The REC project looks at environmental sustainability and humanitarian logistics, uh, focusing on waste management and measuring, reverse logistics, environmentally sustainable procurement and transport, and circular economy. So the WREC, so hence the acronym, the REC. Today, we're discussing a hot topic, uh, which is also recently a similar topic for World Environment Day, which we celebrated recently, the use of single-use plastics and an effort to end plastic pollution. The use of single-use plastics has long been discouraged by environmentalists due to the challenges of recycling, particularly in humanitarian contexts where recycling infrastructure is lacking or non-existent. Um, and as humanitarians, we have a duty to do no harm. However, during an emergency, adverse environmental impacts can result from well-intended, life-saving humanitarian action. So how do we tackle this? to avoid an environmental disaster created during an emergency re uh, response and prevent a converging crisis. Here in Kenya and in East, across East Africa, more and more governments are working on implementing restrictions to the use of single-use plastics to try and curb the effects of these products on local environments. And this has resulted in several changes to the use of plastics in humanitarian operations and contexts, such as product packaging and design, something that was um, could perhaps have been touched on in the last, uh, last session of procurements as well. And today the leaders from pol policy, private sector and implementation will discuss how these single-use plastic bans are being handled, what lessons we can learn, and actions that we can take to advocate as a humanitarian community for more positive changes to policy and practice toward a more environmentally sustainable response. So. Without further ado, and I'm sure you don't want to listen to me ramble on, I turn to our first panelist here today, uh, Dr. Cyril Siwe, who is the head of the Kenya Country Program of the United Nations Environment Program. And Cyril, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, as you know, heads of state, ministers of environment, and other representatives from UN member states endorsed a historic resolution at the UN Environment Assembly here in Nairobi in 2022 to end plastic pollution and forge an internationally legally binding agreement by 2024. Um, the resolution uh, addresses the full life cycle of plastic, including production, design, and disposal. And I wondered if you could sort of talk us through the history of that and what do you think will be the role of humanitarian organizations and civil society in support of such an endeavor? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for hosting me and thank you for inviting the United Nations Environment Program and colleagues, friends, thank you for coming here and to uh, allow this type of interaction to take place. The first question that I can ask myself and perhaps throw up to the, to the room is why banning single-use plastic bags? I will not ask a few people to throw the answer on me, but I think that now the day we, we can get some scientific or some decent answers the first one being just to clean our country, to clean from the shit. The second one is when they single use a few micrograms or a few grams, but once in stroll into the environment, it can last 100 years. 100 years where our cows, our goats, our fishes feed themselves with plastics. In 2017, when, we, when the decision was made by the CES Professor uh, Wahungu, she was very courageous then, I remember 2017 was in a very political, um, sensitive political setting. And if she was not very strong, with a huge civil society behind pushing, 
I think it would have been number time number five or six, yeah, time number six, that the ban would have fell. So in the critical context, like emergency, to come back to your questions, we know that in such environment, and we can see now, for example, in the recent drought in the north of Kenya, how when animals do not have any, when livestock do not have any grasses, they eat whatever they see and end up in our plate. So in an emergency situation, this is more critical. It's more critical because everybody relying on the livestock, everybody relying on the environment, and it's extremely important that the ban took place to preserve what we can still have. The other question could be, yes, but in Kenya, the regulation was not so updated, and how this conversation from the single-use plastic now has emerged to embrace the plastic. That could be perhaps uh, interaction that we could have later. But I would say, how can we, now that the ban has been enforced, how can we, civil society, expert, industry, NGO, et cetera, how can we all now strengthen, enforce the ban of single use and start embracing the ban of plastic? I can see, see we are still very happy to enjoy plastic bottle, but our choice matter for this to happen. And we have to be proud as Kenyan. Let the conversation start here. Kenya was not the first country to buy a single-use plastic bag. But the way Kenya enforce is unique in Africa. What the countries, even Eritrea actually have, ban before Kenya, but they, they fell in enforcing. And you will also recall major company like King Plastic, just to name one, a lot of friends among the Capsa group, who just build a huge plan to produce single-use plastic bags. And this was another element that was very heavy in making the decisions. And the government could have said, let us delay the decision and let for this private sector we just invest in a huge machinery to produce single-use plastic bag to recover from the investment before we can do the ban. And up to today, the ban would have taken place. So it's very important that the national policy, the national framework, create an enabling environment to do so. And this cannot work if it's alone. And that's the reason why, and that was the other side of your question, the integration, the regional integration, it's extremely important. And you will recall that when the ban has happened, many companies were shipping the product and the, the first craft material into neighboring country. And this can, this have stopped only when Uganda, uh, Uganda, Ethiopia, and early on Rwanda, were able now to join the cycle and act as one. So international governance. And this is where the conventions, and the one that you have mentioned, and thank you for introducing, it's now on the discussion. Last week in Paris, the 197 government met in Paris to discuss in the framework of what we call the Intergovernmental Negotiation Committee, which is a meeting of countries, NGOs, et cetera, coming together to negotiate the rule of procedure, as we call it. How is the convention, what would be the dynamics among member states, between member states and NGOs, between NGOs and private sector, civil society, et cetera. And you have probably heard from the media or from different media house that the meeting was very challenging, but at least they agree on the typology, the ranking, the classification of plastics. I mean that the conversation actually is about science. What type of plastic are we talking about? Not every plastic is banned in Kenya, but the single-use plastic bags, and even the definition is very clear from the NEMA site on what is the thickness of the plastic being banned. We still use plastic for, to wrap our food, we still use plastic in the hospital, etc. But when we talk about this convention, what type of plastic are we talking about? And coming to this setting now, how the humanitarian people, how are we concerned about this? Yesterday I was just walking around to see the type of material being displayed in different booths, etc. And I can see, see a lot of plastics. But those plastics are sustainable. Those plastics are not degradable. I mean that you can reuse them for many, as many times as you can. Those used in fil to produce filters and so on. So my word on this particular point is to say, we as a user, as an end user in civil society and so on, we have the possibility to influence the private sector and the industry on the way they produce and the type of material that has to be integrated in producing plastic. Now, 
Looking forward, and I will give you the floor back, what role we as a human being, then as a civil society, private sector, and the humanitarian world, what type of say do we have to take to ensure that our concern matter as this discussion is going on? Because if we don't take our words, the statistic says, and the toxicology says, by 2050, which is next door, 2050 is less than one generation, we will have in the oceans more plastic than fish. It means that our kids will not enjoy the pleasure that we're having. I'm sure that uh, for lunch we have fish in our, in our menu. We won't have it. It is a reality. It's not just a painting. It's a reality. So it's a time that all of us, as we are conceiving or we are designing material for emergency purposes, that we think at what type of plastic, what type of product, what type of material can we use so that the degradation, the degradability, it's taken into consideration. And what should we or what can we do with the existing stock that we have? How can we recycle? How can we uh, reuse? How can we package? And this is extremely important. And my last word is to say, since it's very challenging to go for zero waste, let's just start with simple ones. Let us start with by disposing them in a very sound manner. And this everybody can do. Once we dispose them, make, making sure that as we buy any goods that contain plastic, that we put pressure on private sector to exercise the EPR producer responsibility. And this is extremely important. Perhaps I will stop here for this uh, first round. And I look forward to more engagement on plastic. Because this is not just about plastic, looking for it from far. But it's about plastic, our current life, which is every day. If you look into your every day and the dynamics that you, you have between yourself, your car, your whatever, you will see that plastic is everywhere. So if we don't make a conscious choice, a conscious in our choice, then we will go turning in cycle. And Kenya being a very singular country in terms of very sensitive about wildlife and so on, everything is integrated. So let us see how this integration can happen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cyril. And, and I think that um, you, you mentioned a lot of really excellent and interesting points that lead into our next, uh, next panelist. But I wanted to mention as well, I remember when uh, the plastic ban was first uh, initiated in Kenya and I came to the airport. And you would go to the airport and they would open all of your suitcases and take out all of the plastic bags. And I actually thought when I arrived on Monday that they would do the same. It's been a couple of years since I've been back to Kenya and unfortunately they didn't. Um, I didn't bring any plastic with me, don't worry. But they didn't open my bags and look for the plastic, you know? So it was really interesting in sort of what you mentioned in terms of the implementation and the enforcement of the single-use plastic bans and how that's, uh, how that's sort of leading us into a situation that we have now where it was a bit stricter, I think, in the beginning and it's becoming more commonplace to see more and more plastic again on the streets in, in, across uh, Kenya and, and Nairobi. So that leads us very excellently, I think, to our next panelist, uh, Mr. Brian Gala, who is joining us um, uh, from Takataka Taka Solutions. He's the head of marketing and communications. Um, Takataka Taka Solutions is a waste management company here in Kenya that has been scaling up recycling efforts in the country. And I actually had the pleasure of seeing one of the collection bins at the supermarket just last night. So I was super excited about seeing that. I took a photo of it, so um, very happy. But thank you so much for joining us here today, Brian. And I wanted to, maybe in light of the discussion that we've had so far and the, the remarks made, I wanted to see if you could give us an overview of the continued use of single-use plastics within Kenya. Um, we know that, of course, um, the best waste is one that is not generated, and the most polluting one is the one that's not properly collected and managed. Um, the single-use plastics ban and the role of Takataka Taka to ensure daily waste collection in Nairobi is great contribution to reduce that and mitigate those impacts. But what happens with the waste that cannot be recycled uh, and composted? Mm, thank you, Catherine. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you all here. Uh, I know I'm as passionate as Cyril. We've been together before. Welcome, Kasim. Uh, so at Takataka Taka Solutions, like she said, uh, we are a waste management company and a recycler. Uh, we'd like to think of ourselves as the biggest in the region. 
based on the numbers that we collect. We currently collect over 90 tons of waste in a day, and we make sure over 90% of it is recycled. So uh, Catherine has posed the question of uh, what happens when waste is not recyclable. So this is an area that we are very passionate on. Uh, you find recycling is very dependent also, or it is dependent on a number of factors. So for example, if I'm taking in plastic and I cannot get it through off-takers, if there's no off-taker who's willing to get my recycled plastic, then that plastic we can deem it unrecyclable. Because what we do at Takataka Taka Solutions, when we get your plastic, we actually sort it, we chop it up, we clean it up, and then we create pellets. It's these pellets that we return to manufacturers. And the manufacturers form a mold, and they're able to make new plastic. So we are closing the loop. So we are part of the circular economy. So if these pellets do not get an off-take market, now that's becomes, that, that becomes the problem. The recyclability stops there. So one of the key things that you find uh, as Takataka Taka Solutions, we've invested in quite a number of things that we're trying to ensure. So there's the heavy density, the dense plastic, for example, the likes of HDPE. Uh, that's usually like your oil bottles, uh, where you, uh, your jerry cans, those usually have a good market from off-takers. But we've gone further and we've looked at single-use plastics like PP plastic. PP plastic is the plastic that you put your food tray on. So when you go to a supermarket, and then you find it's a bit flaky. So you find based on the output in regards to uh, the integrity, the density of the material that comes out of it, and you look at the effort put in by recyclers. Many recyclers do not like it. But as Takitaka Solutions, we've ensured that we're, we're actually recycling single-use plastics that were not being recycled before. We've actually now invested in a recycling plant for flexible plastics. Flexible plastics are actually the plastics without a form, so like the polythene bags. So you find like, as it stands now, your sugar still comes in, in, a, poly, in a plastic bag. We are able to recycle that. Many recyclers shy off recycling this type of plastic because when you find it, it's very tattered. It's very dirty, it's used to put food in. Uh, you, it's very hard to actually even identify the type of plastic that it is. If you look at the bottles that you have now with you, you'd notice at the bottom, right next to the triangle, it's written a number, so you're able to know this is PET. But when you're looking at flexible plastics, when you're getting it from a river, when you're getting it on the ground, it, there's nowhere to tell you this is PP, this is LDPE, and when I'm manufacturing it, when I'm putting in machinery where there's an element of melting it and spoiling your machinery, spoiling your blades, you do not know. So this makes it very hard to recycle. So one of the key things we are looking at to help in increasing recycling is we keep asking guys, start early. So make sure that you're disposing your waste correctly. Just disposing your waste correctly, just doing separation at source, just ensuring that it gets back to us increases the recyclability of the material significantly. So you, you, you reduce that question of materials that are not able to be recycled. We are always talking about humanitarians. I know we, you work in conditions with very poor infrastructure, but we found that the humanitarian organizations that have a will that they really want to recycle. For example, we are currently working with World Food Program and we are helping them recycle the waste that they generate at Kakuma, which they return to us, and we ensure that it's recycled. So we are able to reduce the amount of waste that is not recyclable. But to also answer your question, for some that it's not, well, they'd have to go to incineration and other methods like that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. I wonder if I could just quickly follow up with one more question on that. I'm sorry. Um, 
and you're absolutely right. And I think um, when it comes to the value chain of waste and the volumes of waste that humanitarians create in various different um, localized contexts, what support can the humanitarian community provide to improve that collection and proper management of waste, particularly as you had the example of WFP, um, how that's sort of successfully been implemented and what we can do as a humanitarian community to improve that? Um. I think that's a good question, as in it's, it's one that I'm just smiling about. Although I'm always told I'm smiling all the time. Uh, anyway, so when I got in, uh, I found the previous panel, uh, the, uh, the lady, and they were talking about some of the things that they are putting in place to ensure that humanitarian uh, in logistics actually assist in reducing waste pollution. And one that really stuck out for us is the pressure that sh the, uh, you need to put on the suppliers. You need to choose material that is recyclable. Because sometimes, by the time it is disposed, it's too late. By the time it gets to us as the recycler, it's in s there's so much contamination, the material is poorly designed, that recycling can't happen. So for us, it has to start early. It has to start at the supply phase. And at the supply phase is when now, uh, even when you're deciding we're going to distribute food, does this have to be in plastic? We're going to distribute these supplies. Is this plastic recyclable? And then even when you're buying plastic, you need to ask the person that you're buying the plastic from, did you have to use virgin material for this? Does this come from, a, from recycled material? Because if it comes from recycled material, it encourages for more people to actually get into recycling. If there's off-tech market, there's more recycling that happens. And that's the key thing. At the moment, worldwide, we have a, a figure of around 9% recycling. Only 9%. In Kenya, we're looking at around 80% of the waste that goes to landfill is recyclable if it was properly disposed. So why, why should we have a meager 9% out of 80% that we could have recycled? So it's just encouraging if there are off-takers for pellets, if the waste is disposed correctly, if humanitarians just decide that I'm going to go the extra mile, we're currently working even, we are now with ICRC. We are now with FAO. We see them coming into the fold and they're asking, how can we start internally? And then even to the community that we're actually influencing, how can we do better for them? So the humanitarian organizations can help us. They can also push for government to put up infrastructure for waste. Because you find we are currently putting up what we call a buyback center in Kakuma, but the biggest issue is the infrastructure in place to actually collect the waste is so poor that you can't even do it in the bulk that you want. So for example, we use balers. So balers actually just compress waste so that we are able to move it uh, in bulk to our recycling facility. But when you reach to a harsh area where there's no electricity, there's no road network, it becomes so hard. So with humanitarians, you're able to actually just push government, please put infrastructure in place, and it greatly increases like ability. Thank you, Brian. Um, and thank you for your comments. I think those are very, uh, quite timely as well. And um, I think now we're going to turn to Vincent. Um, Vincent Nyabari, who is the Regional Supply Chain Manager for the Danish Refugee Council. And so you are working as an implementer uh, of humanitarian activities. Um, and thank you so much for being here with us today, Vincent. I wonder, and uh, it, 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 of course, Brian, you're right, it sort of links circularly to the discussion that was taking place before about um, procurement and really putting pressure on our suppliers. Vincent, I wonder if you could talk about, since the single-use plastic bans have come into effect, and how you understand them as an, implementing, uh, as an implementer, how do, did your suppliers react, perhaps, if you made changes to procurement specifications, or um, did they struggle with some of the single-use plastic bans, um, and maybe what did they, they struggle with most, if they did? Okay, thank you, Catherine. Um, actually, uh, what I can say is um, 
most of the suppliers uh, did struggle when this uh, implementation of the ban came into place. Uh, you could find that uh, because the window period that the, the suppliers or the vendors that they were given to transition from the single-use plastic uh, to an other alternatives, it was very, very uh, small. So you will find, um, for example, uh, this, uh, these bidders, they, uh, they could try to uh, have uh, alternatives, but the alternatives were not that viable. Because most of the people will say the best alternative will be uh, using the um, paper, uh, paper, or paper like the Manila kind of bags or something of the sort. But uh, if you look at it from the other side of the coin, it's also not viable because we'll be killing our forests. So the, the few alternatives that were there, it, could, it was costly if you, if you analyze it from the perspective of starting from the production cost until uh, the final product is achieved and uh, distributed to the consumer. So you'll find um, most of the bidders could uh, shy, uh, shy off uh, from, for example, uh, when you're trying to uh, source for these particular items, the bidder could say, uh, because of the strict uh, uh, policies or measurements that are in place, the specifications that we are going to give these bidders, it becomes hard for them to bid because they don't qualify. So you'll find from the pool of, let's say, you could have a pool of 100 uh, vendors, but only you'll find two or three vendors uh, could, uh, were able, uh, could meet the, uh, the specifications, whereby uh, you find there is no uh, much value for money when doing the whole process. Yeah. Thanks, Vincent. And I wonder also, I mean, in terms of the regional context, um, is DRC using any sort of lessons to reduce the amount of plastics and single-use plastics that you're procuring across the region, perhaps, and advocating for a different um, reduction of plastic in your procurement and sourcing? Thank you for that question. Actually, that's a wonderful question. Yes. From... Uh, for, from the lessons learned from the Kenyan context, uh, DRC, Danish Refugee Council, uh, we have taken it up. In fact, if I can start, currently uh, we, uh, we, have a fair, we have a project of a recycling project, whereby it's called a Fair Recycling Project, where we have partnered with uh, Mr. Green Africa. Um, of course, I know, taka taka. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we look forward to being also partnering with you guys. Um, so we are partnered with uh, Mr. Green Africa, where, uh, whereby from the lessons or the findings uh, that, uh, uh, that, uh, we, uh, that we have realized from that project, we share with our stakeholders, uh, which is uh, uh, like the governments, uh, even the donors, and also other institutions, and whereby we also try to enforce through um, we enforce the government legal framework of the, uh, uh, of the ban or in other countries. And also we try to sensitize through our programming because uh, uh, from the lessons that we have learned through the programming in other countries, we try to enforce through sensitization and uh, creating awareness, uh, creating awareness about uh, the, uh, uh, the ban of the single-use plastics. Also, um, the, the, uh, the other way, we shall lead uh, the, the, from the lessons that we have uh, that we have learned uh, from the Kenyan context, how we implement it, is is whereby now uh, we we take. Uh, we take these lessons and incorporate them or integrate them into our programming and uh, our programming system of the organisation. And when, you are, uh, when we are implementing these programs in various countries. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm aware of some of the, um, the policies that the, the Danish Refugee Council is working on in terms of tendering criteria and specifications. So it's, uh, it's very exciting work. Um, I wanted to open up now to see if we have any questions from the floor. I see we do have one. Enu Sindeche here. First, thank you so much for, I mean, great information that we've received from the three panelists. Actually, my question goes to Taka Solution. I'm very keen on uh, monitor and evaluation. How do you gauge that? I mean, how do you get the impact of the, of the work that you do? Thank you. Uh, should I just take it through? OK, uh, so thank you. Thank you about that. Uh, one of our core values at Taka Taka Solutions is we are data driven. And our main aim as Takataka Solution is to cause impact. 
So to ensure that we actually cause impact is we have to measure. If it's not measurable, then you're not able to control it. And you're not able to scale it up, and you're not able to take interventions. So one of the key things we do, of all the waste we collect, we collect data on it. Yes, we collect uh, even from, we start from uh, industrial, we do retail, we do houses. When we collect that waste, we actually collect data on it. When we actually collect from our buyback centers, we actually collect data on it. So we have data on this, so we're able to tell you your waste profile as our clients. We're able to tell somebody that this is the amount of waste you've been producing this month. We're working with one of the biggest uh, telecommunications com companies in Kenya. We are giving them a waste profile, telling them this is the amount of waste you're getting. We are working with the UN. We tell them this is the waste you're getting, and this is the fractions that you have. So we are able to tell them authoritatively that 60% of your waste is organic, around 20% is plastic, and this is the amount of waste that's remaining that's not, uh, that's any other fractions. So when we have also this data, from our data team at the ground, we're able to tell you also the percentage that was recycled. So we look and we tell you of all this, we are able to recycle this percentage and we give you individual data so that you are able to take interventions. We're dealing with one of the biggest brewers in Kenya and we even give them the same data so they know that uh, last month we had this much waste we did this intervention, now we have this much waste. And then the biggest one that we actually do, we measure your greenhouse gas emissions. So we give you your GHG savings in kilograms. So we are able to actually tell you this is your GHG emissions, and this is the equivalent of what you've saved. So that's how we feel confident that we can say authoritatively that in the past year, we were able to recycle over 95% of the waste we collected. That is how we're able to tell you authoritatively that we are collecting over 20 tons from our buyback centers across the country and over 70 tons from our clients in a day. So yes, that's how we measure impact. And of course, we other, have other places that we do though. Uh, once again, this is Dominic Obadier. My question is uh, to Takataka Taka Solutions, uh, Brian. You're doing an amazing job. But uh, <clears throat> you know, Takataka Taka is uh, our waste, pl precious plastic uh, recycling is one of the complex, uh, requires mental, or it has to start from the mind, right from the supermarkets. People don't have the knowledge, so now they can be able to sort the waste before you can be able to collect it and uh, sort it and crush it and send it to wherever you're sending it. So my question is, what is your take to create uh, education awareness to the school institutions and other governmental institutions to be able to create the mindset change to be able to fight uh, plastic? Great, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Uh, so one of the key things, I, I like the way Catherine said, oh, the minute she entered, she was able to see one of our <laughs> segregation bins. So for us, one of the key things we, we really advocate for, before uh, waste can actually be recycled, it has to be segregated. So if you do not get it segregated, you actually find that it's very hard to recycle it based on contamination. Just giving a small example of, for example, if you have your organic waste and then you have broken glass in it, it's almost impossible to remove the broken glass from the organic waste. Just, just to give you an insight of contamination of waste fractions. So one of the key things we've done, we've done the separation bins, which we've put in all the major malls in Kenya, in Nairobi at the moment, we're still scaling up. So that's one of our key things. We are able to put up the bins so that they're able to show people, please, and we've clearly labeled, here is plastic. We've color coded it to make it even simpler. Put plastic here, put paper here, put aluminum here. That's just one of the physical aspects that we do. 
Now there's the element of awareness in regards to information. So every time we get a client, uh, we are working with mm, uh, very many schools. We're working with Brayburn, Banda, Brookside. Uh, we, we have quite a number of schools that we're working with. And we always ensure that we offer a training on waste management before we induct you in. So when you get in, there's an awareness that's raised to be able for you to know it. The other thing, we are part of the Kenya Plastic Pact, uh, who have been also working a lot with the government, so that they put up the Sustainable Waste Management Act that was passed last year. And one of the key things that it mentions is the need for awareness. So there's a need that even the government is now putting in place measures in collaboration with NEMA to ensure that people know that separation is important. Separation does actually happen. Um, first and foremost, I think awareness raising is something that we're very passionate about um, as a humanitarian community, particularly as it relates to um, starting the process, right? So if you look at the supply chain cycle, you think about the products that are in use that are being delivered in humanitarian operations, looking at those product specifications, um, packaging, etc., that can create a lot of the waste that we see that remains in situ in humanitarian operations. And I think, um, you know, uh, practitioners and, and implementing partners like the Danish Refugee Council, other NGOs, and the UN are working on different policies uh, and training packages to support that. One of the things that we're doing as part of the REC project as well is, is a, a training package specifically for humanitarian logisticians that, that creates awareness uh, and provides tools and training um, to our logisticians. But I also wanted to take us back one more step to the data collection uh, question earlier. I think it's quite critical because we've, we've all made a commitment as humanitarian organizations to reduce our impact on the environment. But you can't reduce something if you don't have a baseline, if you don't know what data is out there, what you're creating in terms of waste and greenhouse gas generated uh, generations. So I wondered. Um, if maybe any other panelists wanted to speak to um, the, the, the data um, collection and different figures that we have to be able to, yeah, here we go. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Katrine. Um, we receive UNEP, as you know, um, multilateral agencies or organizations. We receive requests from, even from the government actually asking for data. And uh, for those who are familiar with the UN and UNEP uh, publication, we have this Global Environment Outlook that analyzes and set the, the baseline for, uh, I would say, most of the ambience and most of the, the issues that matter at the global level. And uh, there is a need, and thank you, my, uh, my friend and brother, Brian, that you're doing the, that work, you're collecting data. Whatever you are, I think collecting, gathering data is very important. And as you said, um, Catherine, if we don't have the baseline, it's very difficult to measure the progress. Just one number. Globally, plastic waste is 3.7 billion tonnes per year, currently. Cascading down to Kenya, before the ban, estimation, before, because we didn't have the exact data before the ban, before the ban, plastic, single-use plastic and all the plastic at the waste and the dump site was evaluated to 7.8 million ton, just in Kenya. Actually, since the ban, and this is a number that we have aggregated and measured, we are about 3.5, 3.7 million ton per year generated. So you can see it's still a lot. So if nothing is done, if you don't turn the curve, by 2050, we will be dealing with 50 billion tons of plastic into the environment, and mainly half in the oceans. These are projections based on very reliable calculation. So before I hand over the, 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 the mic, we have to really praise the private sector. We have to praise the private sector. Because these data that I have just communicated is also because we have set enabling environment for private sector to come in. And whatever you're doing the ban, if private sector, who are in most of the case information provider, service provider, employment provider, etc., if you don't work hand in hand with them, there is no way that we will succeed. And in the emergency and the crisis context, private sector is important. And you can just see, you can just look at the booth that you have. How many, um, how many country, how many official booth do we have? I think apart from the welfare program, uh, most of them are private sector. So private sector is very important, and it's good that from yesterday, 
uh, space was provided to private sector to just share their experiences. But we also have to listen to private sector. What type of enabling environment do they need? What type of policy? How can we work hands in hand? We, are, we don't have a planet B, as my boss used to say. And to close on this, you have heard about the three planet, triple plan, planetary crisis, which is the pollution, which is climate change, and biodiversity losses. All are interconnected. When you are born, a baby who is born in a dirty room, if the room is polluted, if the, quality, the air quality is not at the level where he can feel safe from the very early in age, it's already breathing pollutions. So you don't need to go in a dump site and you don't, go to go, uh, you don't need to go in a smoke area to be polluted. So this is a global concern. And it's connected to the waste management. It's connected to the way we consume and produce. It's connected to the way we dispose plastics. Because those who are not selected, even if they can reuse or they can transform, 90% we still have the zero point something or the 9% non-treated, we can still have, we'll still have to go to the dump site. And the dump site will be incineration, or incineration. And incineration will be releasing into the environment all the pollutants that we all know. So again, it's connected to the ecosystem, it's connected to the biodiversity, and it's connected to the climate change. Those who used to come in Kenya, yesterday I have listened to the maestro saying that this is the second time that they are coming here, the first one is in Geneva, and so on. Those who used to come in Kenya 20 years ago, they can tell you that the temperature was not what it is now. It's getting warm. And I think the news was saying that last week in the uh, pole north, the north pole of the continent of the of the earth, we have registered the highest temperature never recorded, almost 40 degrees in the Antarctic, in the Arctic, which is huge. I don't I mean in terms of melting, that's huge. And we all know that 10 centimeter increase of the oceans, you have 20% of island being flooded. Just think about the number. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next question. Thank you. Hi, I'm Anita Rotman from IRC, and my question is for Vincent. Um, so you mentioned making changes to procurement specs, and I'm just curious, have you ever had to make a decision between choosing the more sustainable supplier or the more local supplier, and kind of how do you weigh your different criteria? Thank you for that question. Yes, we have. Um, I can give you a, for an example. Like um, I can see at the back there, we have a bottled plast uh, a plastic bottled water. So we had like a, our specification was when we were booking like a conference booking, doing a conference booking, uh, we give them specifications specifically. We don't want to see uh, 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 plastic uh, bottles water bottles and we want to see only glass water bottles but uh, one vendor who was the who, who was the lowest in terms of cost vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the second lowest was the, the cost of the, the the margin the margin of the cost was not that significant okay if i can put it into um, uh, perspective like uh, let's talk about it was let's say between of five dollars and um, six dollars, so that's a, a dollar difference. So we decided to go with this, the second lowest, who was uh, compliant, uh, who was green compliant, whereby we chose the six, the six, the vendor who had quoted for six dollars vis-a-vis the five dollars. So that's the criteria that we used. We, uh, we we try to see is the cost significance, is there value for money? If, for example, uh, we are uh, we look at like the cost is very significant as compared to the impact or the effect like uh, these specifications are going to have is rather we go with um, these specifications rather as compared to the, uh, to the cost. That clear or? Yeah, okay, thank you. It is wonderful that you are, you are focused. But I want to direct uh, my questions to my brother from, from UNEP. First of all, may I introduce myself? I'm Joshua Adem. I work in the public health, and also the same, I'm concerned about the environmental health. The question to my brother from UNEP is just very simple. I would like to know exactly, are we trying to manage 
the use of uh, the plastics, or we are trying to see that the plastics are eliminated. So I, I don't understand, because I've heard one of the speakers there was, was saying when she landed at the airport, she was not inspected. But the first day she came, she was checked of everything because plastic bags were not allowed inside. So it looks to me that the government was trying to manage, not to uh, eliminate. Okay, so there you will tell us exactly what are we doing and what are you doing as UNEP? Are you eliminating or you are just managing? The question is, have you reached out to the manufacturers so that if it is to eliminate, have you shared with them your, your ideas so that you find a solution to eliminate the plastic use so that it becomes successful? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Joshua, and thank you for those uh, two great questions. And you give me the, the opportunity uh, by starting with the conclusion. My conclusion would be to invite you uh, anytime at your convenience to UNEP, and then we can have a tour of the number of activities that we have in the pipeline, not only to manage, but to ban the plastic. Um, Jackie start this uh, intro by talking about the conventions. And the convention have many, many chapters, many pillars. One is to ban. Ban at the source, ban to produce. But let me come back first to your question. Um, as you know very well, the United Nations and uh, the little international civil servant we are, we have employers. And our employers are the government. Maybe you didn't know that, but I'm sure that you know. So we do what the government asks us to do. They tell us, oh, um, uh, the Mount Kilimanjaro used to be more high as we used to have snow there, and what is happening then, we, with many experts, including from the health sector, et cetera, we bring experts there, we do some function, we go back to the lab, we monitor, we evaluate, we assess, and we tell them, this is the reason why the, the, the ice is melting on the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. And they tell us what to do. And this way now we come. We tell them, you have to act on the policy. You have to act on the governance. You have to act on ABCD. You have to put the science. You have to do environment education. You have to change the curriculum. You have to train more the doctors. You have to have more toxicologists. You need to ABCD. But once we have done that, the implementation is in the hands. And once it's in the hands, Joshua, it's now also in the hands of civil society, NGOs, private sector, to drive, to push, to pull and to make those that they have elected to do the right thing. That's why, Joshua, back to you. You guys, you have to be very serious when you're electing your people, when you're electing governors, when you're electing your CMC and all those people. You have to make sure that your voice count and that you will look very carefully, very seriously, very consciously to the manifesto and see which one have the manifesto that fit with your behaviors, what is sustainable, what will guarantee the life of your child, grandchildren, etc., and make sure that the legacy that you will give to the future generation is less polluted than what you have found. This is you, not UNEP. UNEP has done its part. And particularly in the plastic domain, after the ban, UNEP have assisted NEMA in a very, very strong way. We organized, and I was leading that things that my, my job, we organized the roundtable of private sector to tell them at least three things. The first one was, oh, guys, look at the picture. Of course that you have invested a lot of money, but look, this is a picture. This is how harmful the way we are going, the trajectory that we are using. If nothing's done, this is where we are heading to. That was the first message. The second one was, you are the private sector. You can do something. You can create a green job. You can turn what you're doing into more sustainable, less polluting, less polluter actions. And this is what you can do. Then we assist, we deliver training, we strengthen the capacity, we train the officers and so on to also introduce not only the EPR, but also to exercise their, their social responsibility. And you can see some company, just to name one, Safaricom, I will also name Airtel, so that there's no conflict of interest, who have increased drastically the social, the social responsibility part. And some have even went further. 
to introduce in the curriculum of the school that they are funding, that they're providing grant, environment education on how to mitigate the climate change element and so on. The third message that we have provided to the private sector was, you have to work hands in hand with the government. Because government and gov the government and yourself, you're not competing. The government creates an enabling environment. They create a good environment for you to exercise that you pay taxes. But at the same time, you have to work using the best practices, the best environment techniques, et cetera. And this is what we have been doing. Moving forward, in terms of plastic ban, again, to move away from the management that you have mentioned, we start preparing private sector for the ban of plastic, not only the management. And during the last um, United Nations Environment Assembly, we organized a private sector forum where we provide opportunity to private sector across the world to come and showcase what they're doing. Mainly the Nordic were very well advised, come and show us what you're doing. But I will surprise you, Joshua. In Kenya, we have a company who transformed plastic into fuel. Can you imagine? I already knew that. And the president gave him actually an award, the previous president, Uru. He gave him an award. It's a private sector transforming plastic into fuel. So he doesn't go to the petrol station, actually. He and all the car from the company. Inbox, I can give you the details. You also have a company in Kenya who produce, who transform plastic bottle into fiber, textile fiber. And they can produce clothes like the one that I'm wearing actually with plastic fiber. In Kenya, innovation. And this is a company being created by a youth association. Average age, 32, 34. I don't have to, to, to be more vocal about how um, the Kenya youth, they are very innovative, they are very prolific, et cetera. But go to the university, actually. We were working with the Karatina University. Karatina, uh, Karatina University, they have a curriculum on graduate a PhD. Uh, and they are already have two PhDs in the pipeline on alternative to single-use plastics. And this is innovations. And you have also heard that there is a Kenyan young uh, woman who won a prize, I think, in Oslo on um, producing cup, coffee cup, um, ice cream cups with, that you can eat at the end, based also on some element from plastic. This is revolution. This is innovation. So on your first question, I would say, there is a lot of innovation going out there, a lot. But what we need actually is awareness that was mentioned, strong awareness. And this is also part of the company that the convention will, will have as a provision. It's your voice, our responsibility, your responsibility to, to push those who are mandated to have this conversation with other member states. And to say, oh, you guys, don't only look at the big picture, also look at what we, public, we can do. And the last one. Your last question, I'm sure that it's a bit provocative. Sindio, I'm sure it's a bit provocative. But I will answer, however. You have heard about antimicrobial resistance, where health and environment, this matter to us. And you have mentioned, I'm sure that you're on the heart of it. Plastic is also part of that conversation. Now, from the experience that we learned from the emergencies and the risk management and so on, this platform, what return in terms of feedback can we have, knowing the context and uh, the context and the contextualization of the intervention that the core people here have in the daily life? What type of feedback can we provide to this nexus so that as they move on with the conversation, they can be right to the point? And this is individual actions, individual. It's citizen. When you go to the ballot, it's citizen. In your daily work, in your choice, the way you consume, the way you produce, the way you dispose, the way you reuse, it's in our daily action to say, am I doing the right things? We don't have a plan B. Hello. Yeah, thank you for the organizers and uh, for the panelists for the, for the session. My question goes more into moving waste from country to country related to uh, plastics. Although I would love for next sessions, we can also tackle the point of uh, hazardous waste. Uh, you know that we work in South Sudan or some countries where uh, infrastructure is quite limited, but yet we respond with quite a bit of uh, items that could be better managed even here in the country in Kenya. But our government is quite uh, reluctant to also uh, leverage uh, around waste. So thank you.
Uh, I, could, I could speak to that a little bit first uh, and then hand over to my colleagues. But I think one of the things that um, is really critical is advocating for waste management uh, infrastructure in country so that you avoid cross-border transportation of waste because that creates additional um, greenhouse gas emissions, it creates additional you know, issues that we don't want to necessarily have to tackle. So I think if we can advocate for and have the creation of a waste management infrastructure in country and particularly localized solutions to responsible waste management, there's also reverse logistics activities that could take place uh, in terms of your supply chain. So if you're procuring um, different items if you work with your manufacturers and waste management suppliers and say, hey, if the truck is going back empty, I'm going to put, you know, baled plastic in it or I'm going to create, you know, give you back the waste so that you can take it to a centralized uh, waste management facility, that's a lot better than having it in situ. But I, I also open up to my, my panelist colleagues here if they have any comments. 30 seconds. Uh, currently, there is uh, what we call the Rotterdam Convention on the Trans Movement of Waste. Yeah? And Kenya is a signatory of this convention. So exercise your, uh, your citizen right and push for the best practices for this waste not to move from one to another one. And the second one is the Basel Convention on ban of any movement of waste in, within Africa. So back to you, citizen. Exercise your right and make sure that this, not, this doesn't happen. Um, I just want to say again, thank you all so much for joining us here today. Um, if anybody wants to sort of get in touch with us, we'll be, we'll be around. And also, I encourage you as well to check out the uh, Global Logistics Cluster REC website. Um, it's at, it's at logcluster.org slash um, REC but go to logcluster.org and we're sharing a number of different tools and information and different um, examples of responsible waste management practices that you can all have a look at. So thank you all for joining us here today.